Good day everyone and welcome to another video. So in this video, we will be talking about process and process variables, uh, things that are very important in your study of chemical engineering calculations. Later on, we will be having some uh, sample calculations, so I would appreciate it if you would uh, perform the calculations with me later. Let's begin. This uh, PowerPoint presentation is already uploaded in our Blackboard accounts. After watching this video, you could go back to this PowerPoint presentation and read it for yourself if you need to. Okay, to begin, let's first define what the process is. In here, a process or any operation or series of operations that causes physical or chemical changes in an input. That is the very basic definition of a process. But the main thing to remember here is to not get confused between process and process units because there are so very subtle differences. Uh, the second bullet here says if an apparatus or equipment is involved in the process, then we call that a process unit. So that is the difference between the process and the process units. The process is the operation itself, while the process unit is the equipment or apparatus that is used to carry out the process. To give you an example, let's give examples of processes and process units. Okay, so that we will know what is the difference between these two terms. Let's start with something basic, something that you might have already encountered. I will be naming the process baking, like baking bread, baking cookies. So if baking is your process, then what should be the process unit? The process unit should be the equipment that allows us to perform the process, which is baking. So in this case, the process unit is an oven. So this is just in uh, simple terms. So if we go to more technical terms, let's say, for example, the process of evaporation. So what type of equipment enables evaporation? Therefore, the process unit is an evaporator. Another example, if the process is drying, then the process unit is a dryer, and so on and so forth. So I hope this gives you a uh, clear idea on what separates process from process units. Now, why is this important? This is important because when you are making flowcharts, like for example, in, in, uh, in this example here, when we are making flowcharts, we are simply drawing boxes, and you are writing the name of the process unit in the box. It's never the process, it's always the process units. If, let's say for example, if our process is drying and I were to construct a diagram or a flowchart for that, the box should include the name of the process unit, dryer, not the name of the process. So if you write inside the box drying, this is already wrong because we are uh, or we need to use the name of the process unit in the box, okay? And for this to become a material balance problem, there uh, something has to go in and something has to go out of this box. In material balance problems, you commonly would see streams that are going in and streams that are going out. So those that, that are going in are called the input streams, and those that are going out are called the output streams. Now, keep in mind that we are not limited to one stream for input and output. Of course, there are some uh, process you know, wherein you, you only have one input and output streams, but it's, it's also possible for other processes that you have multiple inputs, single output, or single input, multiple outputs, or multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And that's what makes material balance complicated because if you cannot write the correct diagram, and if you cannot uh, correctly identify how many inputs and how many outputs do you have, then you cannot truly solve the, the problem. Okay? Moving on. We have defined the process. We have defined the process units. Now let's define what a process variable is. So a process variable is a measurable quantity in a given process of which its change can happen rapidly. 
this would be the bulk of our discussion for this video because the process variables are oftentimes the one that we are solving for or the one that are given and even the ones that are unknown. So some common examples of process variables are flow rate, pressure, temperature, etc. You could also have volume, mass, anything that is measurable. Because in a, uh, a real-life plant, anything that is measurable would be taken as a process variable because that's something that you can control, it's something that you can measure, and it's something that you can use to measure other variables. We will be discussing each of the most common process variables. First, first on the list are the trio of mass, volume, and density. These are very important quantities that are almost always involved in chemical engineering calculations, mostly because material balance deals with mass. We define mass as the amount of matter contained in a substance, volume is the space occupied by a substance, and the density being the ratio of mass to volume can be used as a conversion factor when converting from mass to volume or volume to mass. No? So these three are, are very important parameters. Next, we have specific gravity. Okay, Specific gravity is defined as the ratio of the density of a substance to the density of water at the same temperature as the substance. Uh, some might argue that uh, density and specific, specific gravity are quite similar, no? but that's not actually the case. The main difference lie with their units. So density has dimensions, it has units, but specific gravity is dimensionless because it's a ratio of two densities. So basically, the units would cancel each other. For a material at 20 degrees Celsius, we define its specific gravity as the density of the material at 20 degrees Celsius divided by the density of water at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, the main reason why some people think that density and specific, specific gravity are quite similar is because of the denominator. Your denominator here is the density of water, which in some instances is almost equal to one gram per cubic centimeter. So if you are dividing something with one, then it's just, uh, it's just the same number. The confusion happens if you are switching units. If the units of density is no longer grams per cubic centimeter or grams per ml, the density of water is no longer one. Therefore, you, you can no longer say that the specific gravity is the same as the density of a substance, okay? Uh, it gets more complicated if you are using English units because the, the standard density of water in English units is about 62.3 pounds per cubic foot. No? So that's, that's quite different. So just remember the definition of specific gravity. Next, flow rates. Flow rates would be the most commonly encountered thing in uh, material balances because the processes are not static processes. There is an input, there's an output. Therefore, we just can't, we cannot categorize those input and outputs as mass. We have to categorize them as flow rates. No, It's the measure of how much substance passes through a boundary per unit time. If we say mass flow rate, that's the amount of mass flowing in or flowing out per unit time. Volumetric flow rate is for volume and molar flow rate is for number of moles. The mass, volume, and moles, we can have uh, special conversions between the three of them, of course, depending on the uh, molecular weight of the substance or depending on the density of the substance. Next, okay, speaking of moles and molecular weights, this allows us to convert from mass to moles and vice versa. The mole and molecular weight concept would be much more important when we are already dealing with material balance with chemical reactions. Because if we are dealing with material balance without chemical reactions, you can treat moles the same as you would treat mass. The law of conservation of mass would state that the mass coming in would be equal to the mass coming out. That's also the same case if you're talking about moles, but if there's no chemical reaction. So if there's no chemical reaction, the number of moles coming in is also equal to the number of moles coming out. That's not the same when we are dealing with material balances with chemical reactions because the number of moles would change. The only thing that will not change for material balance with chemical reactions is still the mass because we are still abiding with the law of conservation of mass. Okay, 
you already know this concept of the mole and molecular weight. Normally, we, we, we are just going to use them when we are converting from molar composition to composition by mass. Okay, speaking of composition, we can express composition in various ways and these are very important for us chemical engineers because this is how we communicate what's inside something. Okay, so we can communicate composition in terms of by mass, by mole, or by volume. So these are just percentage by mass, percentage by mole, or percentage by volume. Next, temperature. So temperature is a scale of how hot or how cold a body is. And we have two types of temperature. We have relative and absolute. Relative temperature, uh, that is your degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit scale. For absolute temperature, that is your Kelvin and your degrees Rankine scale. Okay. Next, pressure. Pressure is defined as the force acting perpendicularly to a surface. We will be dealing with uh, pressure most likely when we are discussing material balances involving gases because as you know, gases among the three basic states of matter are the most affected by pressure. When we are dealing with solids and liquids, pressure does very little. Oftentimes, we just assume that the change is negligible due to pressure. But when you are dealing with gases, they are easily compressible and we need to, to apply changes in pressure. Okay? Mm, very important for gases as well as liquids. For liquids, not that much because a uh, majority of the liquids are incompressible, meaning even if you apply a very, very large amount of pressure, their volume would change very, li very little. No? We can just have our engineering assumptions and assume that there's no change. We have two types of pressure, just as we have two types of temperature. We have gauge pressure and absolute pressure. So just to give you a review, how do we differentiate between gauge pressure and absolute pressure? Our formula for converting between gauge and absolute pressure is that the absolute pressure of a gas is always equal to its gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so you're simply adding the atmospheric pressure to the gauge pressure to get the absolute pressure. In some problems, it gets tricky because some problems might not mention what type of pressure it is. In those cases, you will need to rely on deduction if they, are, if they meant to say absolute pressure or if they meant to say gauge pressure. Throughout our future lessons, I will be teaching you how to read between the lines in a problem to determine whether it's an absolute pressure or a gauge pressure, okay? Some of these values can reach zero. Some of these values can even reach negative, but some of this can never be negative, okay? For example, the minimum value of absolute pressure is zero. So the absolute pressure must always be greater than or equal to zero meaning absolute pressure can never be negative. If you are at an absolute pressure of zero, that means that you are in space. You are somewhere wherein there's absolutely no pressure. Gauge pressure can become negative. So gauge pressure can be less than or equal to zero, but it, it can also be greater than or equal to zero. What does it mean when gauge pressure is negative? If you have a negative gauge pressure, if you uh, take a look at our at our equation here, if you have a negative gauge pressure, you still have to add that with the atmospheric pressure to get the absolute pressure. And since absolute pressure can never be zero, the minimum value of gauge pressure is actually negative atmospheric pressure, just to give you a zero absolute pressure, okay? So when your gauge pressure is negative, that means that you are in a vacuum. When the gauge pressure is positive, meaning that you are in a compressed state or, or you are in a uh, compressive state. Compressed state meaning it's, you are compressed relative to the atmospheric pressure. Okay? Never forget the distinction between absolute pressure and gauge pressure. Okay, the rest of the slides will just be examples. So these examples would be very important 
for us before we start our discussion on material balance itself. Uh, these examples are basic, um, basic problems that deal with maybe conversion between one type of composition to the other. So I need to uh, give you practice on how to convert things. Okay. Let's solve the first one. An industrial strength drain cleaner is composed of 50% water and 50% sodium hydroxide by weight. And we want to convert this composition to mole fractions. Let's for, uh, I will first write the given. So we are given 50% water, 50% sodium hydroxide by weight or by mass. And we want to convert that to mole fractions. Okay. Here's our given. You have you're given 50/50 water sodium hydroxide by weight, and we, we, we want to convert that to mole fractions. Okay. I will be introducing to you the concept of the basis. The basis is a very important concept in chemical engineering calculations that lets you simplify a problem, or it lets you find a very simple solution to a somewhat complicated problem as you would learn in, in our uh, later lessons. But for now, you can think of a basis as something that you can assume that, that will not change the conduct of the problem. So an example here would be, I would assume that I have a basis of, since we are uh, percent by weight, I can assume that I have 100 grams of the mixture. Now you might be asking, where did I get the, the 100 grams mixture that is not in the given? Well, the 100 grams mixture is my basis. It's my assumption that does not change anything in the problem at all. It does not change our given. It does not change our end result. So why does it not change our, our result? Well, because you're given percentage by weight. If you give any kind of mass as a basis, then you're not changing the results. But why did I choose 100 exactly? So I chose 100 because if you multiply a percentage to 100, it just returns the same number. 50% of 100 is 50, and that makes it a lot easier for us. If your basis is 100 grams of the mixture, that means that automatically you have 50 grams of water, and you also have 50 grams of sodium hydroxide. See, we simplified our calculations. Now compare the scenario if you were to choose a hard basis. Let's say for example, that you don't want to use 100 grams of, as your basis. Let's say that you chose 256 grams as your basis. If you have a 256 grams of mixture, you have to get 50% of that. That's, your, that's the amount of water you have and you get the, uh, the other 50% is sodium hydroxide. So that entails more calculations. You see what we're doing here? We are simplifying our calculations, okay? So for conversions of percent by weight to mole fractions, we will be doing it the simple way. So we will be doing it in a table, just like this. I have here on the first row, I have the mass. So of course, we cannot convert anything from mass to mole without the molecular weight. We need to get the molecular weight of the substances in grams per mole. So water has a molecular weight of 18 and sodium hydroxide has a molecular weight of 40 grams per mole. Okay, so there's our table. Now we have to convert these substances from mass to mole. So our next column would be the number of moles. Okay, so let's convert. We just have to, to divide 50 divided by 18. We have 2.78 moles. And then for sodium hydroxide, we have 50 divided by 40. We have 1.25 moles and we get the total. The total number of moles for this system is 1.25 plus 2.78. We have 
moles. Now that we have the uh, total number of moles, we can easily get the mole fractions. Remember, the, for the mole fractions, you simply have to get on your numerator the, the amount of your substance and in the denominator the total amount of the substance. For water, I will just be uh, writing a small formula here. The mole fraction of water, 2.78 moles of water divided by the total number of moles in the system, which is 4.03 moles. Okay? And whatever you get, that's the mole fraction. For water, our mole fraction is 0.689 for sodium hydroxide we have 0 0.310 and if you total this you should be able to get a value of 1 in our case I think this is a little bit less than 1 so 0 0.689 plus 0 0.31 we have 0 0.999 now is is a total result of 0 0.999 okay? So in our cases, it's it's okay. This is just due to rounding error. Now, if you will remember our lesson on significant figures, okay, we have to apply the concept of significant figures here. If I'm going to count the 0 in 50 grams as significant, then I need to retain only two, two significant figures in my final answer. We will be left with 0 0.69, for water and for sodium hydroxide that's 0 0.31 and if you add that you get an exact value of 1. If you don't get exactly 1 that means that you did not apply the rules of significant figures. Okay now this total mole fraction of 1 assures you that we did the correct conversion and we, we, we also did the right process because mole fractions should always uh, be equal to 1 in the, uh, in the total. Therefore, what, is, what are our answers? Therefore, if you have a 50% by weight water and a 50% by weight sodium hydroxide solution, we converted that and we have obtained a 0.69 mole fraction for water and a 0.31 mole fraction for sodium hydroxide. That is our first example. In our future problems, expect that you would be encountering more problems like this, but these are not the uh, only problems in the problem. These are just some of your uh, preliminary calculations before you can proceed to the material balance. It would be better if you can, uh, if you can practice this skill. Okay? By the way, if you are finding that my discussion is quite fast, you can actually pause on this video and then go back to the PowerPoints and then you can catch up. Okay, next. Next problem. You have a mixture of gases is composed of 12% CO2, 6% CO, 27.3% CH4, 9.9% H2, and 44.8% N2. How much will 3 pound moles of this gas weigh? Okay, so let me first write the given. Let's go to the board. Here's your given. You are being asked, or our required quantity here, is the mass of the system. Or how much does does your mixture of gases weigh. Now you might notice that system of units given here is the English system because we are using pound moles. Now you have two options here. Your first option is to convert pound moles to moles or you could just solve this problem in English units. Therefore, if we choose the second option, your mass here would have a unit of pounds if we would be staying true to the English system. In our exams, I will be specifying what would be the units of your final answer. Okay, so there would be so that there would be no guesswork. Okay, so let's dissect this problem. You're given the number of moles total. You're given the composition. However, you are not sure if this composition is percent by mole, 
percent by mass or percent by volume. All that is stated is that this is a gas. Okay? Now, I will be giving you some tips on how to handle these types of problems. Normally, when you are given a gas, so I will be sectioning off some here. If you are given a gas or if you are given a liquid or if you are given a solid system and you are not sure whether the percent composition is by mass or by mole, so here's a rule of thumb. For gases, it's almost always percent by mole. Why is that? Because gas, because the num the volume of gases is much easier measured rather than the mass of the gases. Because gases are very light and gases are very difficult to handle. So it's much more practical to measure the volume. And if you can measure the volume of a gas and you can obtain the percent volume composition, the percent by volume is equivalent to the percent by mole composition for, for ideal gases. Okay. Now for liquids and solids, which are both very easy to measure by mass, even though liquids can be measured by volume, but they are uh, easier and much more accurately measured by mass, then you would be assuming that they are already given as percent by mass or percent by weight. Okay, this is a rule of thumb that you will be applying throughout your entire chemical engineering calculation journey. So do not forget this. If it's a gas, consider it percent by mole. If it's a solid or a liquid, consider it as percent by mass, except if it is uh, if uh, if it is stated otherwise in the problem, let's say for example, uh, in in a given problem the system is a gas, but the but the percent composition is given as percent by mass. You still have to follow the percent by mass. This rule of thumb is only for instances wherein you were not given something. Okay, so let's go back to the problem. You're given the percent composition in percent by mole. We presume. Now it's time to choose our basis. We just have to get the number of moles of these substances in pound moles. And then we have to determine their molecular weight for us to be able to uh, convert them. The molecular weight here, sorry, the molecular weight here would have units of pounds per pound mole. And then from the molecular weight, we can convert everything to mass with units of pounds. Okay, now I will be giving you an opportunity to pause this video. You solve first this problem on your own. I have already lay, uh, I have already given you the layout of the solution. You just, you, you just have to fill out the entire table. And then later after you're, uh, you're finished, solving this problem, you can play again the video and then you can watch this solution. Okay, so if you want to practice, you should pause now. For the solution, okay, we need to get the, the number of moles of each component. You simply have to multiply everything by 3. 12% of 3 is 0 0.36. 6 percent of 3 0 0.18, 27 percent of 3, 0 0.819, percent of 3 is 0 0.297, and then 44.8 percent of 3, that is 1.344. And then if you want to make sure, you can add everything together and it should result to 3. The total is 3 pound moles. Okay? We have verified it. Now let's list the molecular weight of the substances. The molecular weight of CO2 is 44 pounds per pound moles. For CO that is 28 for methane that is 20 uh, sorry 12 plus 4 it's 16 for hydrogen it's 2 
for nitrogen, that's 28 pounds per pound moles. Okay? Okay. Now, let's convert everything to mass. From number of moles to mass, what should we do? We simply multiply the number of moles with the molecular weight. So, if you could see the units, if you multiply molecular weight with moles, you can cancel the pound moles and you will be left with pounds. Okay? So, let's multiply. For CO2, we have 15.84. For CO, for CH4, for H2, and then for N2. And then you just have to add everything. Okay, the total number of moles is, or sorry, the total number of pounds or the total mass of the system would be 15.84. Point twenty one pounds. Okay. Now, for the sake of applying significant figures, what uh, of course your given is only one significant figure, but what you can do here is to not base on uh, the number of pound moles of the system because that is just our that that can be just part of our basis. You can base on the number of significant figures of the composition. This list of uh, compositions here. The least number of significant figures is 2, that is 6.0. Okay, so you can apply two significant figures and our final answer here is 72 pounds. The total mass of the system is 72 pounds. Okay, so that is how we convert a molar composition to a composition by mass. Remember this because we, you would be encountering this a lot, especially on the, on the second half of our term. Okay, if you want a uh, copy of the solution, you may uh, take a picture right now because we will now be moving to problem number three. Okay, last problem. This problem now has a mixture of different process variables and we will be manipulating those different process variables to come up with our solution. In the production of a drug, having a molecular weight of 192, so let me list down some of the given. The molecular weight is 192. I would assume that this is grams per mole. The exit stream from the reactor flows at a rate of 10.5 liters per minute. If you take a look at the numerator unit, that's liters, that tells us that 10.5 liters per minute is a volumetric flow rate, and we represent volumetric flow rates with uh, the variable Q. That's 10.5 liters per minute. The drug concentration is 41.2% AQs. That tells us that your mixture is binary. One of the component is the drug, the other component is the solvent. In this case, it's water. The balance from 41.2 uh, subtracted from 100 is the composition of the water. And the specific gravity of the solution is 1.024. 1.024. Calculate the concentration of the drug in kilogram per liter in the exit stream and the flow rate of the drug in kilomoles per minute. Okay. Here are our given. I have listed all of the given from the problem. Now, one thing that was not given here is this one with the asterisk, the uh, concentration of water. So we deduce that this is 58.8% because we simply subtracted 41.2 from 100. So that is how we got 58.8, okay? Now, if you take a look at the required values, we want to get the concentration of the drug in kilograms per liter. Let's first focus on that. 
what do you think can we use as a basis here? In choosing basis, you first have to look at your given. If you have something that can be used as a basis, in this problem, we have something that can be used, and that is the volumetric flow rate. Okay? The volumetric flow rate is 10.5 liters per minute, meaning at a certain or meaning for one minute, there would be 10.5 liters of your substance passing through a given boundary. With that in mind, we can easily set the basis here as one minute of operation. You see what I was doing here? I'm setting the, the denominator of the volumetric flow rate as our basis for easier calculations. If I set one minute of, of operation, that immediately tells us that the volume of the system passing is 10.5 liters. Because 10.5 liters per minute multiplied by one minute is equal to 10.5 liters. That's the, that's the beauty of a basis or that's the power of a basis. Okay? Now, if you want to make your life difficult, you can choose another basis. Let's say, for example, uh, you choose a basis of 52.1 minutes of operation. Why not? You would still arrive at the uh, correct answer, no? but it would just take you a longer amount of time. Okay, now, take a look at the units of the required. The concentration of the drug, the units is kilograms per liter. You basically have to take a look at your given and then check what do you have. We already have the numerator, that's the liters part. Okay, we now have that one, that's the 10.5 liters. We just have to get the kilogram part. So where do we get that? You see that we have the volume. We also have the specific gravity. Therefore, we can convert our volume to mass. And then from mass, we can apply this percentage by mass. Remember, it was not stated in the problem, but we can say that this is percentage by mass because, again, based on the rule of thumb that I gave you earlier, for solids and liquids, we use percentage by mass. Okay? Now, some more deductions. If my specific gravity is 1.024, if you go back to the, to the definition of specific gravity, the specific gravity is the density of a substance, or the density in this case, the density of the solution, divided by the density of water at the same temperature. The temperature here is not mentioned. It's fine. We can assume any temperature. No? As long as in the specific gravity, it's the same temperature at the top and at the bottom. For this case, I will be saying that the density of water is 1 for easier calculations. But that 1, the unit of that is grams per cubic centimeter. or grams per milliliters. So if my density of water is 1, therefore, the density of the solution now is the same as the specific gravity. It's 1.024 grams per cubic centimeter. And now we can use this density of the solution to convert our volume to mass. Okay, so let's write that here. Okay, so volume... We have 10.5 liters. We will be uh, using the dimensional analysis method to solve this problem. So the 10.5 liters, the liters must first be converted to milliliters because that's the uh, unit in our density. So one liter is 1,000 milliliters. The next factor would now be to convert milliliters to grams or from volume to mass. So that's where the, the density would factor in. So the density is 1 point, sorry, it should be in the numerator. The density is 1.024 grams per 1 ml. You have learned previously from, from, from our previous video that 1 cubic centimeter is equal to 1 milliliter. So this is just the same. Okay, so we now have converted, converted this to grams. But we don't want to stop there because your the concentration of your drug wants your numerator to be in kilograms. So we have to convert from grams to kilograms here. So another factor, 1,000 grams is equal to 1 kilogram. If you take a look at the cancellation of units, liters will cancel, milliliters will cancel, grams will cancel, and you are left with kilograms as your final unit. 
calculating, the result of this is 10.752 kilograms. Okay, now we have your numerator units, okay? But keep in mind that this 10.752 kilograms is for the entire solution. We, are on, we only want to get the concentration of the drug itself. So we need to apply the percentage by mass of the drug, multiply that to the mass of the solution to get the mass of the drug. The mass of the drug is simply 41.2% of the mass of the entire solution, 10.752 kilograms. Our answer here, is 4.4298. This is kilogram of the drug. Now, you might be asking, why am I not applying the rules of significant figures for this floating calculations? Let me remind you, the rules for significant figures will only apply to your final answer. It will not be good if you keep rounding off your digits when you are in the uh, in the uh, floating values or the non-final values, okay? Only round off your, your final answers, not your, your, your floating values. We now know that we have 4.4298 kilograms of drug. Now, to get the concentration of the drug, you simply have to, your numerator is the amount of the drug, 4.4298 kilograms divided by the total volume of the solution. The total volume of the solution is 10.5 liters. You will see here the evolution of the units. We were able to obtain the kilogram per liter units that was required by the problem. Okay, solving. The concentration of the drug is 0 0.4. Okay. Since this is now our final answer, we need to, de to determine how many significant figures do we have. If you take a look at the given, the least number of significant figures is 3. So therefore, we need 3 significant figures in our final answer. 0 0.422 kilogram per liter. That is our final answer. This is quite a, a, this is a routinary problem for material balances. Okay. For the second case, we want to find out the flow rate of the drug. Now, if you take a look at the units, that's in kilomoles per minute. If you take a look at our flow rate, that is in liters per minute. So we want to convert from volumetric flow rate to molar flow rate. Okay, let me write our plan. We plan to convert from volumetric flow rate, we convert that to uh, mass flow rate, and then from mass flow rate, we convert that to molar flow rate, or the, uh, the flow rate of the drug in kilomoles per minute. You can do this. You can convert from volume to mass using the density, and then from mass to mole using the molecular weight. But there's actually an easier solution to this. We just need to get the mass of the drug that we used from the previous problem. If you'll remember, the mass of the drug is 4.4298 kilograms. Uh, if you would remember, a while ago, we set our basis as one minute of operation. This is where the magic comes. No? Since we set the basis as one minute of operation, whatever mass you get, that also becomes a mass flow rate because you just have to divide 4.4298 kilograms with one minute. That makes the mass flow rate as 4.43 kilograms per minute because we set the basis as one minute of operation. Therefore, I just need to convert the mass of drug to moles of drug, divide it by one minute to make it the molar flow rate of the drug. It's that easy. We did, we did not have to, uh, to go through this very long conversion. Okay, so let us convert 
from kilograms to kilomole using the molecular weight. So the molecular weight is 192 kilograms of the drug is 1 kilo mole of the drug. Okay, so the number of moles of the drugs is 0 0.0231. I'm using three significant, okay, we, we are using three significant figures. Now, since the basis is one minute, therefore, the molar flow rates of your drug is simply 0 0.0231 kilomole per minute. And we were able to solve that just by converting the existing number of ma the existing mass of the drug to the number of moles of the drug, dividing that by one minute as our basis. Then you have the molar flow rate. This shows you the importance of choosing the right basis. If you were to choose 500 minutes of operation, you would mess up your calculations for the volume coming from the volumetric flow rate plus. In the computation for the molar flow rate of drug, you have to divide the moles of the drug by 500, thus increasing your calculations and thus increasing your chances of error. Okay, so choosing the right basis is a very important skill to develop, and we hope to develop that skill in our future video lessons. That's the end of this video. If you have any questions on, on uh, our problems, you can set an appointment with me. I can meet you via Zoom and we can discuss some things. Now, after you watch this video, you have to answer a problem set uploaded in your Blackboard accounts. The, uh, the composition of that problem set would, uh, would have something to do with the problems that we solved today. Okay? And that is to check if you really learned something. Okay? That's it for this video. Thank you for listening and as always, stay safe.